name is Reina Lopez, and today I'm actually representing the two organizations that have uh, come together to bring us uh, Dr. Fred Cummings. So the first one is the International Society for Gesture Studies, Hong Kong Hub, and the second one is the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. For those of you not familiar with the ISGS Hong Kong, we set up last year and um, we've been organizing seminars almost every month. And this is the first seminar of our semester, of the semester. So welcome everybody. And hopefully we'll be seeing you um, in all the other ones that we're going to be having. And we, we have a couple of people confirmed for, for the next months, but not everybody has confirmed yet. So that is why I am not giving you the names of upcoming talks, but please keep an eye on our website because all of that information will be there. Then the other thing I, I wanted to remind you of is that in June, we would have the LSPPC conference, um, which is being organized here in Hong Kong by CTU and the ISGS Hong Kong is actually participating with a panel. So could I invite you or could I encourage you to join the conference? There's going to be um, an invited panel on gestures in teaching and learning specifically with some great speakers, as you can see here, um, we've got Marianne Goldberg, we've got Gail Stamm, Elena Nicolaris, um, as well as uh, Tania Smotrova, closer, closer to us, and uh, Simon Harrison and Catherine So from Hong Kong, so very close to us. And yeah, so I really encourage you to, to join us in the conference and certainly join us in the panel. Um, we are hoping to be able to make the panel available to everybody later on. Um, ISGS members, but just in case you shouldn't miss it. And with that, can I remind you all to please uh, mute your microphones, mute, uh, sorry, close your cameras. All the questions will be fielded at the end. So keep, keep, um, you could write them in the chat as we go along if you want to. And at the end of Fred's presentation, while we selecting selecting the questions or giving you access to the mic if uh, if that works and uh, i actually have a little surprise for fred because i am not going to introduce you i am going to ask someone else to do that for me and let's hope the camera doesn't follow here it goes good evening to you uh, if you're Amen, in you part do? of the world, and good day wherever you are in your part of the world. I think it's, uh, it's probably usual at events such as this to have a distinguished speaker introduced by somebody equally or almost equally distinguished, um, preferably in a somewhat related area, or at the very least, somebody who has some academic credentials and some, uh, some uh, understanding of the subject matter. We're breaking with that tradition today. Um, my only qualification to introduce Fred is the fact that, unlike any living linguist, I think I know him not only before he became interested in speech, but possibly even before he began to speak. Uh, we're, we're near, we grew up as near neighbours. Uh, we were close friends. I was close friends with his older siblings. I was a frequent visitor to his to his family home, and the dinner table conversations that I recall there ranged from patent law, to Japanese sentence stru structure, to mechanical engineering. Nothing was out of bounds. And so it's no surprise at all to find Fred describe himself as an interdisciplinary sort of person. Anything else would be bizarre. Um, his work has ranged over cognitive science. There are influences from ethnological observations. There's a, a strong philosophical background there as well. And for the lay listener, somebody who's interested in language rather than linguistics, I think it's the breadth of these interests and the practical focus, and I suspect in many areas, practical application of his work that makes it interesting. 
Above all, what makes him worth listening to is the fact that he's a very engaging speaker. I've said enough about him now. I'm going to leave him to speak for himself. Fred. Damien, thank you very much. That was the, a wonderful and, and very unique introduction. <laughs> Hello from Ireland. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's great fun to talk to uh, at such distance. And I'm just going to start sharing my screen, I think, is probably the best way to get this game on um, the road. Can, you everyone see that, Fred, can, I, can I just interrupt quickly? Yes. I forgot to mention that we are recording. So that means all of your comments and questions will also be recorded. I'll go away now. <laughs> OK. Um, thank you very, very much for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, it's always a delight to be able to take my work out and discuss it with other people. But it's particularly um, nice to talk to people who are interested in gesture. Um, gesture is, uh, is a wonderful area that is uh, very close to my heart. Um, coming as I do from the field of embodied cognitive science, I'm always interested in the participation of the body in language. Um, and although I will not be talking very much about the details of gesture. I will be talking about a very closely related phenomenon, chanting, which I believe shares a lot with gesture, and that is we share common concerns, particularly with respect to language. So I'll just get going here and uh, uh, there we go. There's language. and. Those of us who've worked in linguistics are entirely familiar with these kinds of um, notations, these kinds of structures. We've got a syntactic tree there that um, describes some kind of order among constituents, which are words. We've got some prosodic notation there. I can see phonemes and tones and prosodic constituents, which are always harder to find. But there's vowels there, which, which admit of nice system, systematic organization. And of course, nothing is as systematic as the dictionary. And once we have a dictionary, we can translate between languages. Languages is a great field. Um, and this, as a linguist, this used to be my home. <laughs> I say used to be. Um, let's see. So when we speak of language, if you're reading linguistics journals, very often you're talking about specific systems which have names like French or English or Yoruba or Yiddish. And that system is understood to be made up of discrete elements that are combined according to rules. Now, there's different levels here, such as phonemes or morphemes or words, or perhaps those ephemeral prosodic constituents. Um, but the, we're looking at a systematic formal domain um, and identifying the boundaries of that or picking them out from the, from the craziness of the whole world is not a straightforward matter. Max Weinreich put it well in Yiddish when he said a Sprache is a dialect mit an Armee und Flot, or a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. And I think you can get the point there that some things are dignified with the term language and others are not. So a dialect only opens the door to this problem because below dialect, we would have sociolects and idiolects. And if we're honest, none of us speak the same way at all times. So right now in talking to you in Hong Kong, I'm not speaking as I will speak later to my cat. Um, now, in order to identify a language that can be systematically described with or without an army, um, there are certain normative practices necessary because we're defining a system. And so something must be either within the system or outside the system. Um, and that is by far, that is greatly facilitated if the language in question is written. Um, on the page, we can easily see sentences. On the page, we can see spaces between words. Didn't always, wasn't always the case, but it is now. On the page, we get precisely those elements that will feature in linguistic theory. And here the prosodic elements raise their head again and start knocking on the door. And of course, as gesture students, you know that there's no gesture on the page. But there again, gesture is rarely admitted to this reified realm of systematic description. 
Um, not only writing, but there are other normative practices that are required. I want to just have a look at an example of what happens when someone who is blessed with writing meets someone or, or people who are not so blessed. And the example I'm taking is from Thomas Bridges. He was a, an Anglican missionary who uh, established a mission in Tierra del Fuego at the very south of South America. Um, fascinating story. Uh, but one thing he tried to do, he, he was also something of an amateur linguist. He wrote the first dictionary between English and Yagan or Yamana. The, the language is, has different names. And here's his observations in trying to figure out what the damn phonemes in this language were. He said the natives pronounce so indistinctly the following letters that it's very difficult to fix upon the proper letter satisfactorily. And he gives some confusions. In writing this language, I have been much hindered by this indistinctness of pronunciation, being often doubtful which letter was nearest and often have substituted these letters one for another and again recurred to the first as nearest the truth. And I like this last observation. No doubt when they learn to read this language, their pronunciation will be strengthened. I find that rather funny. He's trying to shoehorn a practice that people have been, people have been living in the south of uh, in this area in Tierra del Fuego for 10,000 years without the benefit of writing. Um, but he believes that writing will improve their pronunciation. So we're seeing a strange feedback loop here between uh, writing and pronunciation. Um, there are very many other aspects of this that are interesting, but having done a little field work myself, I can uh, testify that finding discrete symbolic elements in language that has not hitherto been written is an interpretive act. It is not merely a matter of sifting through the dirt to find the nuggets. Um, it's not an accident that Thomas Bridges was an Anglican missionary. Um, in the age of colonial expansion, the sense of language changed uh, from a word that was originally associated with some kind of identity of a people. Um, the idea became widespread that language was somehow a generic term and that what was uttered in one language could without loss be translated into another language. This was of course uh, all centered around the notion of the Bible. The Bible spread with the colonial powers and the uh, Bible ultimately became the means by which the boundaries of a language were identified. Put it bluntly, if you were a missionary and you found another people and you had to translate the damn thing again, then you'd found another language. This is a peculiar fact of history um, that has, is not widely known in um, linguistics, but to this day, the uh, scientific resources that count languages, that determine which languages are going extinct and so on, are all based come from a faith-based initiative, the Summer Institute of Linguistics and now the Ethnologue database. So the Bible continues to play this role in identifying languages. But I don't want to exaggerate its role too much because there's many more um, things that need to be in place for a language to be identifiable in this sense of a system. So educational curricula are necessary because otherwise people will just say what they want without regard for whether it's correct or not. There's no such thing as correct if you don't have someone to care. Um, writing conventions obviously play a huge role here. Dictionaries um, allow us to say which words are in the language and not in the language. Um, it is a self-evident fact that in a complex society, the way that you use language will influence your social status, the economic and social distinctions based on language use are of course heavily normative. That is some forms of language use will be preferred and some will be dispreferred in specific social contexts. This has been so since um, as long as we can see. Um, in order to do things like describe a grammar, you need to be able to say that something um, accords with the rules or is deviant in some sense. Um, languages create groups. They create groups which have membership criteria. You are inside or outside. You're a speaker of the language or not. We clearly distinguish between native speakers and second language learners. And 
Interestingly, in the entire formal discipline that has grown up around this way of studying language, there has been, it has been taken almost as axiomatic, certainly in the second half of the 20th century, that it is possible to describe the formal apparatus of language, these components ordered by rule, without addressing questions of meaning, at least context-bound meaning. Semantics is a, a, its own case. So I don't want to say that there's anything at all um, misconceived about that way of studying language. I've done it myself, it's a great thing to do. But the word language is, um, we work this word very hard. We wanted to answer at least two very distinct questions. The first question that we want the word language to address is what is this system that allows humans to pass messages around? Everything we've seen so far has been concerned with message passing, encoded message passing, and the whole apparatus, the general idea that languages are translatable, that their formal constituents encode meanings and so on. All that is forms a coherent and important domain of inquiry, but there is a completely separate domain that we also want the word language to address. And that is what the hell happened to our species? Something happened to one species on this planet that has never happened to any other species. It has profoundly changed the world it has profoundly changed the planet to the point of imminent planetary destruction so we really need to understand ourselves as part of the natural order in order to understand what happened and language in some sense is a big part of this we know that without language human civilization wouldn't have occurred but the notion of a system it turns out will not help us in trying to understand what happened to our species it can't, that notion of language as a system cannot even begin to address the second question. And I want to um, motivate that distinction and suggest why that is the case, and then come back to the second question and see what else we can say about it. So as speaking animals, homo loquens, we have a relatively short history. Now, when you peer back in time, it's difficult to find the boundaries of the human. Um, Homo sapiens' boundaries are, of course, as all natural boundaries, somewhat uncertain. Um, and it's only about five or six million years ago since the last common ancestor of the human and the chimpanzee and bonobo. So that's a relatively short period of time. And, but we know that something happened in that five or six million years ago. So we, we need to pay attention to that period of time. Um, but as we look back over that last five or six million years ago. It's not until we see early evidence of something we might call culture that we begin to recognize ourselves. So these handprints on the wall fascinate me. They started to occur about 40,000 years ago and they started to occur independently in places as far removed as Argentina and Borneo and France and South Africa. For some reason, this animal started putting its hand against the rock face, blowing on it, taking it off and seeing its own imprint. Shortly afterwards, we begin to find evidence of um, music making. So we have bone flutes of ritual in burial rituals. Um, and so we're beginning to see here something of the, the languaging animal. Um, we recognize ourselves in this. Um, so for a little bit of context, I want to, first of all, look at the long history of writing and then at culture. So let's consider writing. We know that writing, the presence of writing as a technology massively affected the, our capacities, our ability to organize, our administrative capacities, our trade, um, our ability to collaborate on, on complicated projects. And writing, I'm only following the Mesopotamian line, one could follow the Chinese line as well. Um, and the actual number of years doesn't matter too much, but writing was pretty much an elite occupation for most of the time that writing has been around. Most people who wrote were concerned with very specific texts of great status, and it wasn't until the origin of printing that texts and the written word entered, began to enter everybody's life. It still doesn't. It's still not the case that the world is 100% literate. And the medium of writing continues to change today. I've put an emoji down there. 
Um, and emojis are disturbing the writing landscape right now, and they have lots of interesting properties. Emojis are completely worth your attention. For one thing, they seem to laugh at these boundaries we draw between languages, because emojis work irrespective of language. But if you wanted to understand what writing did to our species, you wouldn't start with emojis. Yes, emojis will be part of the issue, but there's a, such a long history in which so many things happened that emojis would be the wrong starting point. So that's a 5,000 year history of writing. And against that, I want to put this, we'll go up to 50,000 years. That's roughly the time at which we begin to recognize ourselves in rituals and um, cave art and such. So that blue line there is 50,000 years. And you can see that the existence of writing is itself very, very recent. And the existence of printing is no more relevant to understanding our culture than emojis are to understanding the long history of writing. So it's important to get that sense of scale when we're trying to address the question of what happened to our species. And there's one other datum, time series datum, I would like to put against this. Um, on the top is reproduced that overview of our cultural genesis, 50,000 years. On the bottom, I can only show you 10,000 years. This is the world population. If you look at that, you can see that the world population, the density of the world population has changed dramatically very, very recently. And while this only covers 10,000 years, it's quite obvious that for almost the entire period in which languaging humans came into being, world population was vastly less than it is now. People lived in small groups with relatively few social connections. So there was no great concentration. Even our oldest cities are only um, three, 4,000 years old. So what the, the, the question we're asking as, as to what happened to our species happened somewhere before all this. So the normative conditions that are needed to allow a system like French or Yoruba to exist played absolutely no role in, the Ameri in this long historical story. They didn't because there was no chance for such normativity. There were no complex societies. There were no urban concentrations, no economic structures that would valorize one form of language over another. So in all this time, writing played essentially no role and all communicative activity was embodied. It was face to face and it was situated. And I think as students of gesture, this will seem very familiar because when we study gesture in a contemporary context, we know that we're looking at something which has always been present in human communication. In fact, it's signal absence in such modern mediated forms of communication as internet and telephone is a historical anomaly. Prior to writing, everything that was said was said in a specific context, in a specific place, at a specific time. And in recognition of that, we cannot peel off some elements of that and say, those belong to the domain of language and something else doesn't. We can do that after writing occurs. So the first sense of language is not a useful concept for understanding this long history. And so we're going to need another word if we want to understand the kind of thing that gave us the speaking person, homo loquens. Um, I'm going to use the word languaging just to keep my terms separate and also to make it clear that I'm not in any sense concerned with studying language. Language is a fine thing to study, but languaging raises different questions. Now, other people have used the word languaging for a variety of reasons, and I'm using it here specifically to address the question of what happened to our species so I'm using it to point to a, um, a host of coordinative and affiliative behaviors that found a common world. That's my best adumbration of what is, a, I, I admit, a very, very vague notion of a wide range of behaviors still to be identified, which allow us to coordinate, to come together, to assemble and form a people, and with that, to begin to craft a common world. This, it seems to me, is ultimately what we will want from an account of languaging. So what belongs in there? Well, everything. Gesture obviously belongs in there. Posture 
all those prosodic elements that are hard to fit, they're always present. Hoots, grunts, there's no requirement that every sound everybody make be findable in the dictionary. Signals and signs of all sorts, so I'm not even sure that we should only be looking at vocal modality. I'm very ignorant here, but we all are very ignorant here. But what we can assume is that when people interacted over all this time, they did so in specific contexts in which they had their purposes. And that's going to be difficult to infer from the outside. When I speak of languaging now with this long view back in history, I certainly don't want to suggest that we used to do languaging and now we do language. So as gesture students, I know I'm pushing an open door here. We are still studying languaging. And the idea that language can be constrained within this abstract formal mode of addressing forms of communication needs a little bit of interrogation. So I know you all study gesture and my specialty is a closely related but not identical phenomenon and that's chanting. Um, I want to make an argument to you that chanting is older than writing and is foundational in precisely these kinds of activities that found the human social world. I've chosen the term joint speech rather than chanting. And it's a bit strange that I had to actually invent this term because no term of art existed to describe what happens when multiple people utter the same thing at the same time. That's the most banal pedestrian definition one could have. And it's very, very useful because you can now go out in the world and find joint speech. We don't need theory for this. If people are uttering the same thing at the same time, we've got joint speech. Sometimes we might choose to call it chant, and that word has its own history. There are forms of joint speaking that are popular, uh, indeed a competitive sport in Southeast Asia and in Ireland called choral speaking. Um, one can ask people in a laboratory to speak together. This is how I got into this business. I call that synchronous speech. There was the possibility to call it unison speech, but nobody had ever chosen to identify this as the thing we should we could consider. And the interesting thing about this definition is as simple and pedestrian as it is, it immediately picks out specific domains of human activity, which are ubiquitous and extremely important. So the domains of ritual, prayer, protest, transgenerational sports, primary education, public swearing of oaths. We'll have a look at some of these. And I, at this stage, I've talked enough, and I think it would be great for us to actually look at some of these, some examples of joint speech to reassure ourselves that it's entirely familiar. It's something we all partake in and it's been with humans as long as we can tell. Um, we can all typically agree when we are witnessing an instance of joint speech. Maybe there's gray areas. In fact, I know of a few gray areas, but there's enough substantive clear cases that we can make this an object of inquiry and ask, well, what's its history? All of those practices, the educational, sports, ritual, all these practices seem to have something to do with enacting collective identities. And as I said, with the, when the Bible started to spread, the shift of language went, changed, subtly changed from something which defined a people, in a vague sense, to something which was a generic medium of information transfer. Now we're coming back to practices that define a people for some very weak notion of people. Ritual, protest, sports, primary education. These domains are not accidental. So when we find joint speech, it's not the phonemes we're gonna be looking at, it's the context in which this happens because joint speech seems to always actually affect or bring something about in the world. So let's have a look at a few examples. Here's a simple one, and it's very far from the temple. We're in Edinburgh, and we're watching some street performers, the Sharp Brothers, who are about to do a trick. And they do something I think you've all seen. They may not ever have studied joint speech, but these guys know what they're doing. They're using the joint speech as a means of assembling their audience. Before everybody says yes, 
you could be either a passerby or an audience member. But when, they, when everyone collectively says, yes, they want to see a show, you are now transformed into an audience member, whether you like it or not. And he does it twice to make this very clear. And this is, I've chosen this example from the High Street in Edinburgh, specifically because I want you to see that that formally is exactly the same role that has happens when a congregation says amen in a church. It is a collective assent to participation in what is ongoing. So here's a very quotidian example of some nuns in County Cork praying the Hail Mary, something that scientists have neglected. I don't know why science hasn't been all over the Hail Mary. The Hail Mary is really important. So let's have a look at the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among men, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. What is there to see here? Lots. One thing to notice is, of course, that everyone is assembled with common purpose. There is a great deal of repetitive speaking in which the there are distinguished roles. So we saw one nun leading and the others following. The rosary that they are praying is actually an intricately braided pattern in which the role of speaker and um, congregation are democratically rotated so that nobody appears to play the role of the center or a hierarchical role. Um, these are formal features that we will find again and again. The role of call and response is particularly interesting. We find it in very many joint speech contexts and it plays an important role. Um, I'll maybe pick that up in a minute after we've seen another example or two. Let's change situation. Let's go to a Haitian refugee camp where we see an improvised gathering of a leader and some children. <laughs> That guy is great. He is wonderful at his job. Gesture people must be all over this now. You can see how much full the full body is playing a role. And this guy is doing what grown-ups do with children all the time, using joint speech to assemble them, to bring them together. And we do this, of course, in classrooms. And the children will then later on in the playground do it themselves when they gang up to bully on another child. A group of children chanting nya 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 at a hapless victim is also an assembly formed spontaneously of joint speech. The call and response that we saw in the rosary cropped up there in the Haitian refugee camp. This is, can be formalized now in liturgical structures and liturgical structures will play an important role uh, in just a minute. Here's an example of how the call and response structure can be used so that the text that is jointly uttered is very carefully preserved because only one person is going to say it, but everybody gets to join in through the amen, the generalized assent. In this way, everyone participates in the liturgy, which is, of course, a central religious function. I think people are familiar enough with the liturgical structures, but it's worth bearing in mind that the, the voice of the mob has a bad reputation. And if people are running after you with pitchforks, it's better to run than to reason with them. But here we see another form of the collective voice in which very carefully prepared texts that are of great social value can be preserved over generations, indeed over millennia, um, intact, and everyone can still join in to carefully enunciate the very, very treasured words. This doesn't fit something like a generative or creative notion of language as espoused by Chomsky, for example, precisely because the texts are not authored on the spot. They are authored elsewhere and they are carefully preserved. 
So from a linguistic point of view, this may appear odd, but from a social point of view, this should be very uh, familiar. Now, as a phonetician, when I come to joint speech, I have to question the word speech precisely because we're never quite sure whether we're in the domain of language or the domain of music, neither of which have been articulated. That is in itself interesting, isn't it? When we looked back as far as we could see to see where the language using human came into view, we also found evidence of musicality, bone flutes. And in joint speech, we still live with this ambiguity. Some examples of joint speech are clearly musical, some are clearly not music, and some are like this. These are football supporters, transgenerational football support in England is very popular. Now, there are legitimate questions to be asked as to whether this is music. I doubt you're going to go home and put this on your record player and listen to it. Is it speech? The question is, we don't have an answer to this because with our simple definition of joint speech, we pick out this and we also pick out this. Joint speech is found in chanting traditions, which found entire social orders, um, monasteries or various forms of monastery. The ashrams are found in, um, across the globe and they nearly always have chanting at their core. These traditions are very old and are very carefully preserved. Vedic chanting um, is an example of the profound influence of chant on Indian culture. But we also find this, oh, sorry. I want to go. I want to go back here. Um, I forgot my next slide. Shows once more the ambiguity about the distinction between speech, uh, spoken, spoken, and music sung. Because I, I, I have to warn you here. I'm going to play some propaganda, and I'm not playing it as propaganda. I'm playing it because we want to watch it. Because the Islamic State provided me with an opportunity to show that even a crowd of people who declare that they really dislike music employ music as well so we'll see that the kind of music they employ is in fact unison speech joint speech and all their propaganda came with joint speech at the start but this little clip that i'm about to play you shows that and then it shows another use of joint speech which we will find in a radically different context <laughs> حليفة المسلمين حليفة المسلمين أبو بكر البغدادي أبو بكر So we saw the unison speech from a crowd of people who are the unison singing from a crowd of people who disavow music. Now the borders between speech and music, language and music, and the differentiation of different forms of music has its own history in Islam. Uh, so this is not too surprising, but um, I want to now turn to the second thing where they're doing a pledge of allegiance and a pledge of allegiance is a public act by which one swears loyalty to a particular form of social organization and it's not limited to the Islamic State. These such pledges of allegiance are recited by American school children in the classroom every morning. And if you wish to become a naturalized citizen of Ireland or the US or Canada or, or and most countries, you are required, in order to join that select club, you are required to recite an oath in public in unison with other people. Um, because this is instrumental, it is a speech act of a performative nature in which these are changed once and for all from non-citizens to citizens. There's no expectation that you know the text off by heart. There's no requirement that it be repeated again and again. So it's quite an unusual example of joint speech. And it's interesting to listen to the prosody of this precisely because it's so speech-like. I hereby declare on oath. I hereby declare on oath. And you find same, the same thing in many countries around the world. So joint speech has very many characteristics that we can follow. We've just seen a few examples and I could sit here all day, but I won't. 
let's just pick out some features that generalize across domains. First of all, if we're going to address this, we're going to need some model other than a communicative model, because here speakers and listeners are not separate. The texts are not generated creatively, they are known by all. So that sort of rules out any conventional linguistic approach to this. The repetition that we find is not accidental. We find it in the Hail Mary, but we find it in the soccer chants as well. And we find it in the children reciting their times tables. Repetition is entirely uh, standard in such practices because what we're dealing with here is not the one-time broadcast of a message, but the performance of an activity which brings into being a specific kind of assembly or identity, a collective. And of course, there's no way we can draw any safe boundary now between speech and music. We've seen some formal features. The call and response allows for a great deal of propositional complexity and for the careful curation of texts across generations. And we've seen this powerful mechanism of generalized assent, the yes that everyone recites and is thereby transformed into a spectator, or the amen that allows the congregation to participate in a nuanced and complex ritual. So these all clue us in that we're looking at something which is not bound to one particular cultural domain or another, but has something to do with the manner in which we use our voices and bodies to come together. So how far back can we see such practices? Well, looking at anything in language before writing is difficult. What you see before you is one example, exemplar of what is probably the oldest piece of written literature in the world. Dating from 2600 BCE in Sumeria, this is the temple hymn of Kesh. It is a text that was preserved intact, so we have multiple copies, over a thousand years. So the very first piece of literature we find it lasts for over a thousand years. It's written in Sumerian. In the course of that thousand years, the ambient language changed to Akkadian, but the text remained in Sumerian. That's something we often find, which is that liturgical structures preserve language even as the vernacular changes. So the role of Hebrew in Israel, the role of Coptic in uh, Egypt, the role of Ge'ez in Ethiopia all illustrate this phenomenon. I want to introduce you to this text. It's one of my absolute favorites. Uh, first piece of literature, here's the text. I'm not going to read it out to you. You're very <laughs> you will be pleased to know. It's a whole bunch of stanzas. And that's one of the first things that jumps out at us, at us is there's a structure to this. In fact, there's a structure that we know very well. There's a verse chorus structure. So we have a repeat, we have different verses, a whole bunch of them, but each one ends with the same set of lines. Those are illustrated in red here. Will anyone else bring forth something as great as Kesh? Will any other mother ever give birth to someone as great as its hero Ashki? Who has ever seen anyone as great as its lady Nintur? Those lines are repeated verbatim at the end of every verse. Now we recognize this immediately. This is verse chorus structure. That's where everyone joins in. The fact that this is a temple hymn it marks it clearly as a liturgical structure, but this is a mature liturgical structure integrated into the practice of a people at a time when we can first, when writing first comes into view. I think that's important. So we mentioned that the business of language as an abstract code sort of distracted from the original sense of language as being one way to identify a people. And I'm putting people in brackets there because I don't have a secure term. People have assembled in various ways. We might refer to a common humanity these days, or we might refer to our race, or we might refer to our tribe, or our nation, or our congregation, or our village. There's so many ways I really want to stay out of this, but to recognize that however you define a collective, language has always been at the heart of this. So when we take this long historical view, we don't have a trustworthy superordinate union, but what we do see in joint speech are contexts in which people, whoever they are, are assembled to participate with common purpose. So I don't want to take stock and, and wrap up here fairly soon. 
Since about 1850, we have to accept the fact that we are within the natural order and not separate from it. Darwin landed us with this problem. Don't think that we've solved it. We are still working on this. We still retain the view of ourselves as somehow distinct from the created order. And yet we have to find ourselves in there as embodied beings, as a particular kind of animal. And of course, the question, the long question of what happened to our species uh, is very important to consider in this context. Since the middle of the 20th century, roughly, the population of the world, of course, is drastically different. We are now globalized. Travel and information technology and communication media have established this. And English has become the global means of communication, but English is in no sense any more the language of a people. I say that as an Irish person with, with a certain degree of confidence, I would regard English more as a technology now. But since the middle of the 20th century and the existential position humanity found itself in after the atomic bomb and the horrors of the Holocaust, we can no longer rely comfortably on a sense of a common humanity that we're all part of that collective. The ultimate collective has yet to be identified. And of course, we find ourselves in when we start taking a long historical view, well, the future is a little uncertain. We live at currently in the time of the virus, but behind that we have climate change, behind that we have biodiversity loss, so that a reconsideration of how we should view ourselves and others, including other species, seems to be mandatory. So we started by identifying the familiar sense of language as system, a technical subject concerned with codes and information, and it's a very important subject. But I want to suggest to you it's not terribly useful for these other questions that arise as we consider consider ourselves as embodied persons in interaction with the world. And that the broader sense of languaging is a largely under or unexplored domain in which this languaging creature, homo loquens, came into being. Joint speech seems to me to be a rich vein to explore, to understand how persons create their communities that include some and exclude others. And I think gesture studies can contribute here too because gesture studies are, are looking at some aspect of human coordination and communication, which is part of the long story and not part of the, not solely part of the post writing innovation. Um, I'm not gonna get into the details here. I've presented enough. I will point out that in my world of cognitive science at the moment, there are two broad camps, as it were, who don't seem to agree on anything. There is the orthodoxy, which you will find represented as a scientific construction of the person, which uses the language of information processing, is entirely at home with languages system, valorizes the brain as a locus of consciousness and constructs mind as if it were separate from world. That's an entirely familiar way to construct the person. There are other approaches now which look, which change the sense of the word mind as being something distributed throughout the entire world um, that rests in the whole body and not specifically the brain in which all activity needs to be understood as embedded in specific meaningful and crucially in which we come into being by those activities that we perform and take part in. This is the sense, the core sense of inaction. These other approaches have strong roots, among others, in theoretical biology. So I suspect that this is going to be more fruitful as we try to understand what happens to our species. That's an awful lot, and I'll shut up right there. But I've um, maybe opened a, a, um, a door here. There are some URLs there which people can follow. And if anyone wants to ever contact me to talk about this, they're more than welcome. I wrote a book on the topic called The Ground From Which We Speak, and you can get a free PDF there. Don't tell the publisher at that uh, URL. Um, so at this point, I think I'll simply stop and open the floor to questions.